My name is Mark Daly. I'm a keen athlete, and currently I'm training hard. But I'm also an investigative journalist, and for more than a year, I've been immersed in a story about drugs and athletics. It's an investigation like none I've done before, where I've had to push myself to my physical limits. <coughs> It's a story where there are claims of cover-up and hypocrisy by a British Olympic legend. Nobody would break what was code of a murder, mafia-like silence about drug taking. Would I ask if the drug cheats still retain the upper hand? Seems to be, because we're still only catching 2%. A story that's taken me to the other side of the globe to investigate allegations about one of the world's most famous athletics coaches, Alberto Salazar, the man who steered Mo Farah to Olympic gold. Mo Farah takes gold for Great Britain. Callum Rupp takes second. Seeking out insiders speaking for the first time about Salazar's methods, including two of his former star athletes. He's sort of a win at all costs person. It's hurting the sport. And if the sport's to be saved, it can't keep going on the way it is. It's my journey into the world of sports doping and the science behind the testing regime supposed to prevent it. Where the only way I could truly understand it was to become a doper myself. I'm about to embark on a journey where I'll be investigating major current figures of athletics. But tonight, alone with my thoughts, I review the archive dating back over 40 years of drug scandals. Some examples I remember from my teens. It's Johnson away in clear. Others are closer to home. In recent years, Jamaican sprint stars, Kenyan middle distance heroes and the Russian Athletics Federation have all been caught up in doping scandals. Does that mean all the cheats are getting caught? Or are these high-profile cases just the tip of the iceberg? I was following up a number of allegations and I knew where I wanted to start. My first port of call is the organisation at the front line of the war against drugs in sport, the headquarters of WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency. I've arranged to meet the man who was the founding chairman of WADA, and if anybody knows how hard it is to catch the cheats, it's him. It's a people problem, it's not a system problem. We've got a system in place and we've got laboratories that can do very robust analyses and so forth. So it, but if people don't want the system to work or don't care if it works, it's, it's right now, it's too easy to get away with that. Even today, it's easy to get away with doping. Seems to be, because we're still only catching 2%. I think the technique of doping has, has improved. You're thrown back more and more on investigations, more and more on, on whistleblowers. The perfect example of that is Lance Armstrong. So I'm the most tested athlete on the face of the planet, and that proves that I'm, I'm not using drugs. All it proves is that he hasn't been caught. The Lance Armstrong story brings back bad memories for me. Yeah, planet Armstrong has arrived in Paisley, and it has literally brought the town to a standstill. When Armstrong came to Scotland a few years ago, I was the only one in the newsroom with a racing bike, so was duly dispatched to bring back the interview. Congratulations on your tour performance, and you're also riding in the Tour of Ireland next week. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Best of luck, and I'll, you. I'll see you on the road. Yeah. yeah. Starstruck, not my finest moment as a journalist. When the truth came out about Armstrong, I was devastated but it didn't diminish my love for sport. Armstrong had sailed through hundreds of doping controls. If Dick Pound is right, and only 2% of dope tests annually are positive, 
Lance Armstrong can't have been the only big fish that slipped through the net over the decades. It was insiders, not tests, which were the key to unlocking the secrets of the drug cheats in cycling. And in my investigation into athletics, I've heard claims from insiders from an era where drug testing was primitive and poorly managed. The claims I need to investigate first concern a British Olympic hero with an unblemished record. His name is Alan Wells. Wells became a household name when he won gold in the 100 metres in the Moscow Olympics in 1980. He put British sprinting on the world map and sealed his place beside British sporting greats. The first Briton to win since 1924. Since he retired, he's been an outspoken critic of drug cheats and has called for them to be given life bans. If you take a shortcut to an Olympic gold medal, then you deserve everything that happens to you. At last year's Commonwealth Games, he was given the honour of being the first carrier of the Queen's baton. Millions watched Wells take centre stage in Glasgow as an ambassador for the Games. A new generation of sprinters looked honoured to receive their medals from a sprint legend. But there are questions over whether he won his own medals cleanly. I wanted to start by immersing myself with the athletic stories from the Wells era. I find a series of three investigative pieces that appear in the Times newspaper back in 1987. One British international sprinter who's not named is quoted as saying, if you're not on anything, it's like lining up on your blocks with plimsolls when everyone else is wearing spikes. The clear implication there is that unless you're taking drugs, you simply can't compete. Many of the sources are athletes, anonymous insiders willing to talk about the scale of drug use. One story in particular caught my eye. The most significant thing about the second piece in this series is the reference to the medical doctor supplying and monitoring athletes who were taking steroids. Now, he refers to himself as the junkie doctor. He's called Dr X. And talks about supplying athletes with a drug called S. And the S is stronger. But the articles didn't reveal the name of this mysterious Dr X or the athletes that he was allegedly supplying with banned drugs. I've come to London to meet someone who might be able to help. Journalist Andrew Malone worked on another series of stories about drugs and athletics during the Alan Wells era. Our investigations led us to a chap called Dr Jimmy Leddingham, who was a former Olympic team doctor, who we subsequently found out had been mentioned in a report as Dr X about how Edinburgh and this Dr X had been the centre of organised drug taking within athletics. The fact that the Olympic team doctor was talking so openly about his knowledge of the use of drugs and the fact that he felt that it was his, 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 his duty to try and make sure people didn't harm themselves. I found that absolutely astonishing. An Olympic team, the Olympic team doctor, saying that he was aware of at least half a dozen athletes taking illegal drugs. Because this then gave it a sense that it was institutionalized. If true, who were those half dozen athletes? Malone had enlisted the help of a former sprinter to go undercover, covertly recording conversations with fellow athletes and coaches. It was more evidence, more proof that 
it was something systemic within the sport that everybody was fully aware of the scale of the drug taking, but there was money and glory involved. So it shut down every leak, every story coming out and, you know, trust that nobody would break what was, you know, code of a murder, mafia-like silence about drug taking. Malone's story made waves, but didn't manage to fully crack the silence or name the athletes. There was one man I had to track down, Malone's insider. His name is Drew McMaster. He started off with a yard and a half. Drew McMaster whittled it down to a yard. I'm 23, just. So we've got a long way to go. McMaster was a top-class international athlete and a great rival to Wales. Together, as part of the so-called Flying Scotsman Quartet, they made history. Scotland win, second to the dead, and third Jamaica. The first man with the baton in that race, David Jenkins, would later admit to using steroids during his career. So too, after years of denial, did Drew McMaster. And McMaster was a patient of Dr. X, Jimmy Leddingham. So what more could McMaster tell me? Jimmy's surgery was quite busy with international athletes. And of course, they weren't exactly in his jurisdiction, were they? You know, they're coming from all over Scotland and Britain to see, to see Jimmy. They're coming to do that for a reason. And it's not because I've got a sore ankle. Was Alan Wells a patient of Jimmy Leddingham? A regular. A regular at his surgery. Did Jimmy Leddingham specifically tell you that he was supplying Alan Wells with steroids? Categorically, on a Bible, definitely. You were eclipsed by Wells. Should we believe you? Or is what you're saying the result of a bitter man whose career didn't quite get there? I had a very established and brilliant career, you couldn't buy it. So, was my life enriched? Yes. Bitter? No. The master wasn't away that well. Alan Wells has taken the lead as they come into the bend. Wells has previously attacked McMaster for speaking out about doping, accusing him of smears and raking the gutters. Wells had said, the truth is, McMaster turned to steroids because I had started beating him and I was not using drugs. There is no evidence Alan Wells failed a drug test during his career, but McMaster told me he'd secretly recorded conversations with Jimmy Leddingham admitting supplying Wells with banned drugs. I've obtained some of the transcripts and have made sure they are accurate to the original recordings. These are excerpts from the transcripts of those conversations, the full extent of which have never been broadcast before. In the first excerpt, Leddingham explains his reasons for doping athletes. What I was doing it for, he says, was I knew bloody well that the bloke standing next to you on the blocks was taking the stuff. He's then asked if Alan Wells was also getting his steroids or stuff from him. He, Wells that is, was taking stuff from all over the place, not just from me. Everybody knew Wells took drugs. But he said that he'd never speak on the record about Wells or about any of the other half dozen or so I've known to have taken things. I found another insider, a man involved in Scottish athletics who was close to Alan Wells and to Dr Leddingham. He saw Wells transform from an unremarkable long jumper in 1976 into one of the most powerful sprinters in the world within two years. He's never voiced his concerns publicly and wishes to remain anonymous. I saw that Wells had this really big improvement in his performance. He suddenly started to run around six seconds dead for the 60 yards. Can an athlete go from 11 stone 7 to 14 stone and put on that build naturally? Not at that age, not in my experience. 
When I started to notice changes in him, the changes were big and they were obvious. It changed his personality. Bit of aggression. That's the side effects of steroids. Well, once I had my suspicions, I spoke to Leningham about it. He told me. He told me straight to my face that Alan Wells was getting stronger from him. So how would an athlete avoid a positive drugs test in those days? The doping controls were limited, with no out-of-competition testing. But Drew McMaster claims he was coached to avoid testing positive by the Olympic team doctor, Dr Leddingham. Jimmy talked to me about uh, testing, how the test procedures were. At the same time, he was supplying Stromba, and there was never any question about being tested positive because we were well practised take diuretics and drink lots and lots of water so that your kidneys was flushed out. So um, the testing at that time, it was more difficult to uh, detect. I want to interrogate these claims further, but the man at the centre of these allegations, Dr Leddingham, or Dr X, died in 1998. But there was another insider. Andrew Malone told me about a former athlete who'd claimed detailed knowledge of Wells' alleged drug use. Whilst he didn't want to go public, he gave a sworn statement 20 years ago. I tracked the athlete down, and in a series of meetings, he told me that every word of his statement had been true. He still wishes to remain anonymous. His allegations are revealed here for the first time. He said Wells told him he started using the steroid Stromba in 1977 and was being medically supported by Jimmy Leddingham. He said that he and Wells compared notes about dosages and when to come off the drug to beat the testers. He said that Wells admitted using steroids right up until less than two weeks before the final of the Moscow Olympics. If there was no reliable drug testing, witness testimony is the only way to explore these historical allegations of doping, which, if true, would put Wells' public position as an ambassador of clean sport at odds with his own past. It was time to put this to Alan Wells. He declined an interview, but in a letter, his lawyer said... It is not true our client had used any banned performance drugs at any time. Our client's physique was developed by a training regime. It is denied that any drugs were provided by Dr Jimmy Leddingham. He has never failed a drug test and was subjected to the most rigorous and random drug testing regime applied to any athlete at that time. Wells added that three weeks before the Olympic final, he raced at an event where there had been drug testing. Some of the people I've spoken to about Alan Wells are drug cheats themselves. Others may bear a grudge. Much of the evidence is hearsay. But three men who knew him well have made sworn witness statements implicating Wells, whilst a doctor is on tape admitting to supplying him with banned drugs. Only those who were there at the time can ever know the whole truth. More than 30 years on, how much has changed? I compete in amateur triathlons. I just assume the athletes I race against are all clean. But at elite level, can the same assumptions be made? Over the years, testing technology has improved, but so too have the drugs and the doper's ability to stay one step ahead. The Lance Armstrong saga taught us about blood doping and the explosion of the drug EPO into endurance sport. The latest and most high-profile response to the blood doping threat is the athlete's biological passport. The World Anti-Doping Agency believes it is a crucial tool in the fight against blood doping. How does it work? You take a series of samples from an athlete. You need at least three and preferably four to start the profile so that you find what the normal uh, biological profile of the athlete is. 
and quite simply you put it on a graph and, and you say here's a sample taken on Monday, here's one on Sunday, here's one on the following Thursday, you draw your line, if there's a huge blip away from what we describe as the norm, is it possibly doping? It's also used to say this guy's got a profile which is a bit wonky, go and target test that guy. But target testers have their work cut out, as injected EPO has only a short window of detection. The biological passport is designed not to look for the presence of the drug, but its effect on the athlete's blood. I travelled to Switzerland to meet one of the world's leading experts on how EPO affects the body. Erythropoietin is a substance that is produced within your body, mainly in the kidney. It facilitates the synthesis of new uh, blood cells. And if uh, an endurance athlete started to take EPO? It will increase your amount of red blood cells. These red blood cells carry the oxygen that the skeletal muscle need for contraction. More oxygen, more power, the faster you go. It's pretty straightforward, actually. The athlete biological passports can indicate that you have performed any type of, of blood doping. It will show that you have abnormal variations in your blood counts and that something fishy has got on. Some, including Karsten Lundby, have questioned the passport's effectiveness, but it is seen as the best way to catch blood dopers. So can clean athletes have confidence this test can help deliver a level playing field? To find out, I've come to a decision that I've not arrived at lightly. I'm going to do what no elite clean athlete can do. I'm going to put the test to the test. By becoming a drugs cheat myself. Back in Glasgow, I'm planning my experiment. But without a compliant doctor to prescribe the stuff, how would I get my hands on it? The internet, of course. There are dozens of websites selling this stuff, apparently, from China. I don't know if it's genuine, I don't know if this stuff would ever arrive, but I'm going to give it a try and push the button and order some. I've always been fit and have completed many races. But for the past four months in the run-up to my experiment starting, I've been working with a coach so that I can get fitter than I've ever been. I do this so that when I do start taking EPO, I should be able to tell that any big or unusual improvements I make will be down to the drugs. I knew I had to push myself to my limits. In the meantime, a package from China arrives. Now, whilst it's not strictly illegal for me to have ordered this over the internet, one suspects that someone, somewhere, is breaking a law. Why else would this package be disguised as mobile phone covers? Black bin bag, not exactly pharmaceutical packaging. Two boxes, five vials of 3,000 units of EPO in each box. It certainly looks the part. We had it tested and it was indeed genuine EPO. I was good to go. I'll have my bloods taken every week and for the first three weeks I'll be drug free. I found a source within the anti-doping world who'll run my blood values through the biological passport. I'm training hard in preparation for a scientific performance test called a VO2 max test, which will tell me how fit I am as a clean athlete.
so I just finished the VO2 max test, which is a brutal, unforgiving test of fitness where you ride as hard as you can for as long as you can, which in my case gave me a final figure of uh, 58, 58 VO2 max, which when a normal untrained person is about 35, an elite athlete about 85. I've never been as fit as I am now, and so it's time for the next phase of my experiment. I'm going to be taking small injections or micro doses of EPO. The aim is to take enough to have a performance benefit, but not too much to trigger a red flag in my passport. I was ready, but not, it seems, for everything. Today I took my first shot of EPO and it really felt like I crossed a line. Now, I'm not an elite athlete, I'm not going to the Olympics, but I'm still an athlete. And today, I cheated. I can tell you, it doesn't feel good. As well as having my bloods taken, a doctor is closely monitoring my health while I do this. But unlike Lance Armstrong, I don't have a scientific entourage helping me avoid the pitfalls. I'm on my own. Tonight it was a three hour ride. It was a training session I wasn't looking forward to at all. It's dark, it's cold. My legs were sore. I knew it was going to be deeply unpleasant. Except it wasn't. It was so easy that uh, something just wasn't right. And by the end of the ride, when I should have been wasted, I was fresh as a daisy. I'm training hard, but deep down I know my gains aren't real. I think I'm beginning to get an insight into what it must feel like for a real athlete to cheat, even though I'm not competing. I've never used performance enhancing drugs before, and once this is over, I know I never will again. I stopped riding with uh, my friends now because, well, it's embarrassing. Because, uh, how would I explain why I've suddenly got so good? During this experiment, I pushed my body to the limits. I feel as though the drugs have worked but I'm returning to the science lab to find out for sure. <laughs> My VO2 max has increased from 58 to 63. And the maximum power, my maximum watts the power that I could push the pedals has increased from 350 to over 375. That's about a 7% increase. 7% in seven weeks. The margins are <laughs> incredible. 7% may not seem like a lot, but in elite terms, even 1% would be huge. The point, though, wasn't to see if the drugs worked, it was to see if I could get away with it. I'm now into the critical phase of the experiment where the passport is most effective. It's called the washout phase. I've stopped taking EPO, so my body will naturally want to reset my blood values to normal levels. This is when a blip is most likely. If I was a real cheat, this is the point I'd be most worried about. At last, my experiment is finally over. 14 weeks worth of blood results have been sent off for passport evaluation. I've now been given the results. I can't put them on screen because I need to protect my anti-doping source who put my numbers through the passport. I also want to avoid revealing any information that could help those who want to cheat. I'm surprised by the results, but need expert confirmation.
I've come back to Zurich to Karsten Lundby, who's agreed to interpret the data. I received your results today and I've looked at them. There's no adverse analytical finding, so you seem to have passed the test while at the same time doing EPO. This means, of course, that you got away with it. You got away with injecting EPO into yourself at a dose sufficient to increase your exercise performance. So had I been doing this for real, and antidoping was testing me once a week, yet I was injecting EPO the whole time, I would have got away with it. That is what this study shows, yes. Well, after what seems like months of living like a cheat, thinking like a cheat, injecting drugs like a cheat, today I've been confirmed as a successful cheat. And I got away with it. I think the most depressing thing really is just how easy it was. Now to Montreal, the headquarters of the World Anti-Doping Agency. Whilst I'm not a professional athlete and wasn't subject to target testing, my experiment had exposed a weakness in the passport, its sensitivity to microdosing. What would WADA's chief executive say about what I had done? Well, I'm not worried about you because you're not an elite athlete. Uh, excuse me for saying that, but uh, I think what concerns us, or wouldn't concern us, is if uh, you can manipulate your body to beat the passport program. And the issue is the, the technical analysis, if you like, of the profile to see whether there's a blip that might have triggered either a target test, which might have produced a positive, or whether there's sufficient in your profile to show, well, you're able to take banned substances and still remain normal. That would, that would concern me. I'm just a journalist without any kind of medical support personnel and I managed to drive a coach and horses through the athlete's biological passport. We certainly know that people try to get to the margins of beating systems and the passport will be no exception to that. Back in Glasgow, it was time to take stock. My experiment was over and it had shown that it was still possible to cheat and get away with it despite improvements in the testing regime. Leaving EPO behind, I now needed to move on to a different phase of my investigation. I'd received a tip-off about a famous coach with strong links to the UK. It was time to get back to athletics. Can it be a one-two for the Salazar group? It looks like it. It's Mo Farah takes goal for Great Britain. Gallon Rupp takes second. Alberto Salazar has trained them well and, and they have produced the goods for him. This historic one-two was coach Alberto Salazar's crowning moment of glory. So who is Alberto Salazar? He's a US athletics legend who once ran himself unconscious winning the Boston Marathon. He's the head coach of the world's most prestigious running camp, the Nike Oregon Project, home to Mo Farah since 2011. His coaching philosophy involves intensive training and the use of the latest scientific techniques. And he's been a consultant to UK athletics since 2013. None of the Oregon Project athletes has ever tested positive, but I've been hearing claims about Salazar's methods. And if I'm to explore the allegations, I would once more have to rely on witness testimony. And to help identify those witnesses, I've been collaborating with the US investigative journalism organization ProPublica and its award-winning reporter, David Epstein. It was time to go stateside. After a long flight time, now on my way to meet my first American insider, Stuart Egan. As a youngster, he was friends with Galen Rupp and both trained under the watchful eye of coach Alberto Salazar. Egan had a story which he said had concerned him for years. It was about the prescription steroid prednisone. Galen, myself, and Alberto were outside of a hotel room in North Carolina for the national 
two mile high school championships and we were going on our morning run and Alberto said to Galen, have you taken your prednisone yet this morning? Galen went back up to the hotel room, took the prednisone, or so I assumed, and we just waited for about 10 minutes, he came back down and we went on the run. I was very surprised to know that a 17 year old was using prednisone. Did he appear to have any medical condition which might warrant using prednisone? No, not that I observed. I've heard from various sources that Galen Rupp used prednisone regularly, but he has asthma and allergies which could account for prednisone use. Prednisone is banned in competition, though athletes can use prohibited drugs if they have a clear medical need recognised by a doctor, a kind of sporting sick note known as a therapeutic use exemption, or TUE. We asked Galen Rupp for evidence of his TUEs. In a statement, Rupp said, Earlier in my career, WADA required TUEs for my asthma medication. The few other TUEs I've applied for and received related to the treatment of severe asthma flare-ups. Alberto Salazar said, Galen only took prednisone when needed to treat an asthma flare-up under the direction of his doctor for a limited period of time. I knew Salazar had been the coach of the American athlete Mary Decker Slaney when she tested positive for the banned steroid testosterone. They both denied any wrongdoing. But then I came across something else, a speech by Salazar describing his view on drugs. I believe that it is currently difficult to be among the top five in the world in any of the distance events without using EPO or human growth hormone. I in no way condone doping and am glad that I never felt forced to seriously consider doing it, but I can definitely understand how a good moral person might feel compelled to do so. early morning run and a chance to reflect. I'm intrigued by what I'm discovering about Alberto Salazar. He's now established as one of the world's most successful coaches, but I was hearing stories about banned anabolic steroids being found in the Salazar camp. I'm traveling to meet a massage therapist who worked with Salazar's athletes at their Utah Altitude Training Camp in 2008. After the group left, he says Salazar called him. Alberto contacted me by phone and uh, requested that we go up and uh, clean up the condos, some products that he wanted us to um, ship back to him. He said to me, uh, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. And I said, okay. I was really unsure what he meant. And he goes, um, there's a tube of androgel in the bedroom and it's under some clothing. Uh, androgel, that's testosterone gel, right? Y yes. And I said, okay, we want you to do well, you know, sure. You know, he, you know, he said, like, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. He said, it's for my heart. It's all f***ed up. What did you think of that explanation? I kind of thought a little bit, like, really? Okay, because he had just had his heart attack and his procedure the year before, before we were there. And uh, I thought that was a little strange. I'm on the laptop and I Googled it and it said contraindicated for anybody with a heart condition. Meaning anyone with a heart condition should not take this useless right. stuff. I think the word contraindicated would mean do not or not indicated to, to use. This needed checking. I asked several cardiologists if testosterone gel might be prescribed for someone with a heart condition. All said it would be highly unusual. Also, a coach carrying around a banned drug like testosterone without acceptable justification 
would be guilty of a breach of anti-doping rules punishable by a two-year ban. Alberto Salazar declined an interview. He did not respond directly to this allegation, but in a statement he said, I have always strictly followed WADA rules, seeking guidance from USADA to ensure my interpretation of WADA's rules is correct. What I'd heard so far had come from people who hadn't been directly involved with the Oregon project. I'm travelling to Portland, where the project is based, to meet someone with inside experience. He was a runner who worked with the project for several years. We're calling him Mike, but he doesn't want to be identified. In 2007, he says he was feeling run down and went to see Dr. Lauren Myrie, the Nike Lab's head physiologist. So I did a blood test at, at Nike. Thyroid was low and testosterone was low. Uh, Dr. Myrie suggested that I go see an endocrinologist that Alberto works with, that most of the athletes work with, to get testosterone and thyroid. He told you that you should go see a doctor to get put on testosterone mm -hmm. as well as thyroid drugs. He did, yeah. He said, well, this is what Alberto does. You'll feel better and you'll be able to train better. And so then I said, well, isn't that, isn't that cheating? And he goes, well, no, I mean, Alberto does it. I did, like, mention something about being tested. Like, well, wouldn't it test positive? He said, no, no, no. We'll get you into the normal range. I talked to some people that know sport. They started to put words to it. Oh, that's microdosing. That is illegal. That's a smart way to cheat. Just give yourself small boosts of testosterone to keep you in a legal limit. I was shocked. Like someone punched me in the stomach. If what Mike says is right, then the Nike Lab's top scientist, Lauren Myrie, claimed microdosing testosterone was accepted by Alberto Salazar. The investigation was progressing. But my next move is to meet someone who'd been right inside the Oregon project, the man handpicked by Salazar in 2011 to be his number two. Steve Magnus is now the head cross-country coach at the University of Houston and the author of the coach's manual, The Science of Running. It's intimidating at first. I mean, I get there and I'm watching Kara Goucher work out or Galen Rupp or uh, Mo Farah moved out at the same time, so I'm helping him move into his place. At that point, I thought, oh, it's a dream job. During that first track season in 2011, I started getting hints of this might not be what I signed up for. Steve Magnus was going to tell me a story which he said connected Salazar, his star pupil Galen Rupp, and the head of the Nike lab, Dr. Lauren Myrie, and he said he had documents to back it up. One day when I was at the office, some people from the Nike lab brought up lab reports and put them on Alberto's desk. And it was basically the blood levels of every athlete who had been in the Nike Oregon project. Start flipping through the book and, and came across Galen's. And in addition to the graphs, below every graph, they had uh, basically notes that Lauren had, had taken. Under one of Galen's, it had uh, currently on testosterone and prednisone med medication. And when that, when I saw that, I kind of jumped backwards. I was like, wait a minute, like on testosterone medication, testosterone uh, is obviously banned. And I mean, I knew that, everybody knew that. When I looked a little further, I saw it was all the way back in high school. And that was, that was incredibly shocking. At that point, I actually took a picture of it, wanted to essentially have evidence in case something happens. And when I asked him about it, I was like, hey, Alberto, I, I came across this. I'm just a little bit concerned. And he looks up, looks at it, and he's like, oh, Lauren Myrie. Like, ah, oh, he's crazy. Like, we didn't do that. And that was, that was kind of the last I'd, I'd heard of that. Could it be possible that this was a, an isolated incident? There were multiple little things that kept adding up. To me, it was indicative of a, of a culture. 
This document suggested Rupp was being given testosterone in December 2002. It's unclear for how long. WADA rules today say athlete support personnel involved in doping someone as young as 16 could be liable for a lifetime ban. We would have put this to Dr Myrie, but he died in 2012. Both Salazar and Rupp strenuously denied that Rupp had ever used testosterone. In a statement, Salazar said the legal supplement TestoBoost had been incorrectly recorded as testosterone medication. The allegations are based upon false assumptions and half-truths. Rupp added, I am completely against the use of performance-enhancing drugs. I have not taken any banned substances and Alberto has never suggested that I take a banned substance. I'd now heard concerns from various sources about testosterone in the Salazar camp. But then Magnus told me something else about the use of this banned steroid involving Salazar's son, Alex, with whom Magnus shared an office. He was talking about his dad who asked him to do these tests. Um, and one of them was testosterone. And he explained that they, you know, went down to the lab, rubbed some testosterone, um, took a test, rubbed some testosterone, took a test, and they were trying to figure out um, how much t testosterone would trigger a positive test. And his explanation was that uh, they're worried that, you know, someone could sabotage them. I mean, someone could rub some cream on them after a race, and then that would trigger a positive test. You'd have to have an insane degree of paranoia to accept that, right? I mean, it's, why, why are you fooling around with something like testosterone anyways? So you didn't accept that explanation? No, it seemed ludicrous. So what did you think the reason was? Was them trying to figure out how to cheat the test, right? So it's how much can we take without triggering a positive? There is no evidence that Alex Salazar didn't believe what he told Steve Magnus. He did not respond to questions. Alberto Salazar did not address the claim either, but he did say, I believe in a clean sport and a methodical, dedicated approach to training and have never, nor ever will, endorse the use of banned substances with any of my athletes. Steve Magnus left Nike after the London Olympics and went to the US Anti-Doping Agency with his concerns. But now he says he's afraid of the professional repercussions of speaking out. It's in incredibly scary. I'm 30 years old. I never would have guessed I'd be in this situation in my life. I never wanted to be in this situation. It'd be much easier to just shut up, do my job. I'm doing, I've got a good job, got a good reputation. You can't though, can you? No, can't. Because I'd be living a lie. Over a period of months, I'd heard from a number of former Oregon Project athletes about the so-called grey area, the margin between staying clean and cheating. They talked about the use of asthma and thyroid medication. Some told me that Salazar encouraged the use of thyroid drugs to help athletes shed weight quickly and in turn boost performance. And it was this which led me on to my next insiders, whom I'd been trying to meet for months. I was getting ready to interview Adam and Cara Goucher, the pin-up couple of US track and field. Adam Goucher, looking good. The news will reverberate around the world of distance running today. Not just that Paula Radcliffe was beaten, but it was beaten by a superb performance from Goucher. Both Gouchers are Olympians, both former Oregon Project runners. Previously, Cara had spoken only in glowing terms about their former coach. But now, for the first time, she and Adam said they were ready to open up about why they left the Salazar camp. They talked first about an allegation of unethical behaviour by Salazar relating to Cara's long-term thyroid problem, for which she is prescribed a drug called Levoxyl. Alberta was always unhappy about my weight after I had Colt. Like, it was almost as if I didn't have a child. I just, like, gained 30 pounds. But um, he said, you need to just take some Cytomil. 
That's the drug for... For thyroid. thyroid stuff, yeah. Maybe four or five days goes by and Alberta brought me this prescription drug that I didn't have a prescription for. And you kept, you kept the bottle all this time? I did. It has Alberto's writing on it, clear as day. Sorry to me. So this is Alberto's handwriting? Yes. So did Alberto know what type of prescription you had? Absolutely. He knew what I was on. Did you take them? No. Thyroid drugs are not banned, but some anti-doping agencies, including the UK's, want drugs like Cytomel put on the banned list unless medically necessary. And here's why. A routine check on a drugs information website shows that they are strictly not to be used for weight loss and that large doses may cause serious harm to health. In his statement, Salazar said... No athlete within the Oregon Project uses a medication against the spirit of the sport we love. Any medication taken is done so on the advice and under the supervision of registered medical professionals. He added, Thyroid medicine is not banned and I am not aware of any performance enhancing benefits. The Gouchers had another tale to tell. It relates to alleged abuses by Galen Rupp and Alberto Salazar of the Therapeutic Use Exemption, or TUE, process. The Gouchers say that just days before this race at the World Championships in 2011, Salazar tried to get a TUE for an intravenous, or IV, drip for Rupp. Four years earlier, they claim the same thing happened at the World Championships in Osaka the scene of Cara Goucher's greatest athletics triumph. He said, we have it down. I've coached him on what to say. The doctors will ask him, when was the last time you go to the bathroom? And he'll say, I don't remember. And they'll say, when was the last time you were able to drink? And he'll say, I can't. And he literally said that he, they had it down. I'll be able to say that to you. Yeah. They wanted the IV. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, it made Galen feel better or whatever. And they were manipulating the system to get it. Under WADA rules, the practice of IV drips is prohibited and anyone caught manipulating the TUE process to get one would be liable for a ban. In his statement, Salazar said, I have never coached an athlete to manipulate testing procedures or undermine the rules that govern our sport and follow the process for TUEs. There's athletes that are raising the bar and in a way that isn't real. I had a conversation with Galen in 2011, and he told me how tired he was, how he was so excited to have the season be over. And fast forward a month, and he shattered the American record. That's not how it works. You have to rest, you have to recover, you have to start all over again. Galen Rupp is the most tested athlete in America. So is Lance Armstrong. Doesn't mean anything. This is a... A screen grab from Galen Rupp's blood charts. It says presently on testosterone medication. That's from O2. So he's 16. I think it's going to break his mom's heart. <laughs> There's no reason for him to be on that. I mean, that I can think of. I don't know. That's almost child abuse. I mean, I feel like there's no way it's very unlikely that a, a, a 16 year old would be like making the decision to do this without or even know how to go about doing it. How would he even know how to get something like, like that? Yeah, how would you even know? You were very close to Alberto Salazar. Mm -hmm. How difficult has it been doing this interview today? It's really hard. For years, he was a super important person in my life. I mean, I, I literally loved him. I mean, I loved him. He was like a father figure to me. So it feels like a betrayal, a little bit. And I feel really bad about that. But he put me in this position. The Gouchers left the Salazar group and in 2013 took their concerns directly to Travis Tigart, the US anti-doping agency chief and the man who brought down Lance Armstrong. 
including the Gauchos, we now know of at least seven athletes or staff associated with the Oregon Project who say they've gone to USADA with concerns about alleged illicit practices and unethical behaviour. In a statement, USADA said it takes all reports of doping seriously and we aggressively follow up on every report, but we do not confirm or deny the existence of any investigations. So I took my evidence to the world's top anti-doper and showed him the Galen Rupp blood chart. Presently on prednisone and testosterone medication. Well, you'd need to be on a TUE for that. And it would be very rare that a TUE would be granted for testosterone. You'd have to be uh, pretty exceptionally sick for that. And even then, I would say the doctors would be more inclined to say, well, you probably should be resting rather than competing in, in, in big-time sport. Are you disturbed by what I've told you? Totally. I mean, uh, I would be not only disturbed, I'd be very disappointed. Uh, and that's why I think uh, it needs to be scrutinised by by us as an independent body. In this programme, you've heard allegations about banned drugs and unethical practices involving Alberto Salazar and his star pupil, Galen Rupp. This programme makes no claims about any other Oregon Project runner, nor have any of our insiders witnessed evidence that Great Britain's Mo Farah was doping. But during this investigation, we've spoken to more than a dozen athletes or people closely connected to the Oregon Project. And if the allegations about Salazar are true, then Mo Farah has been coached to world success by a man who has used banned methods. We showed the allegations to Andy Parkinson, the former head of the UK anti-doping agency. On the basis of the allegations that you've shown me and, and that I've seen, certainly any athlete who's involved or associated with this group, including Mo Farah, should be seeking the necessary assurances around the fact that they're operating within a safe environment. Athletes have got a responsibility to have a close look at that and to, to ask the question of themselves, do I feel comfortable in this environment um, and am I going to be able to continue to complete clean in this environment? There's no suggestion Nike is involved in any wrongdoing. It's in the public interest to ask questions about what Mo Farah knows, if anything, about these claims. In a statement, Mo Farah said, I have not taken any banned substances, and Alberto has never suggested that I take a banned substance. From my experience, Alberto and the Oregon Project have always strictly followed WADA rules. In this journey, I've learned drug testing alone isn't enough to keep sport clean. My investigation would have got nowhere without the testimony of the athletics insiders who spoke out. I'll look at sport with different eyes now, but I'm sure of one thing. I have an even greater respect for those athletes who choose to compete clean. <laughs>